Good morning, my name is Karl Herman, and I would like today in this lecture to introduce the basic principle of uh, ChIP-seq analysis. So I'd like to start with uh, reminding the very basic principle of the ChIP-seq ChIP experiment. So usually we have a protein of interest, um, and we would like to determine the binding sites of this protein on the DNA, or we have specific histone modification, which we would like to uh, uh, track on the, on the genome sequence. So the protein of interest is indicated here by these red dots. And the first step is to do a sonication um, after, um, <coughs> after um, covalent uh, cross-linking. And through the sonication, the DNA gets um, fragmented in little fragments of 300 to 500 base pairs. Now, some of these fragments are bound by the protein of interest or show the histone modification, and some are unbound. These are the gray uh, fragments that are displayed here. Now, the core idea of uh, ChIP-seq is to use um, an antibody that will specifically recognize the protein of interest or the histone modification. And through chromatin immunoprecipitation, the bound fragments can be isolated from the unbound fragments. And so we see at the bottom left of the, of the slide the fragments that um, have been um, selected by the chromatin immunoprecipitation. And now um, these fragments can be identified and sequenced using high throughput sequencing. And uh, what is sequenced is actually the three prime end, the five prime and the three prime end of these fragments. And I've indi indicated the reads that are actually sequenced here uh, by these red and blue uh, fragments. So what comes out of the sequencer are these red and blue reads. And then the next step is to do an alignment on the reference genome. And then a typical um, situation would be displayed on the bottom right, where we have a promoter of a gene, and we see very nicely the red and blue reads that align and that show a very specific enrichment here at this position. Now, the fundamental question in ChIP-seq analysis is very similar to signal uh, analysis. So we have a signal, uh, which we call the treatment, which is actually the result of the chromatin immunoprecipitation, which is shown in green here. Um, and we have a reference, which is a background, also called input, which is displayed here in, in red. And the question is, um, at each position on the genome, do we have more si uh, signal here in this um, green window than in this red window here? Right? So we're looking for regions where we have a significant enrichment of the signal compared to the background measurement. And we're going to see in detail how we can address this question. Now, I have, um, I have listed the different steps uh, in a typical ChIP-seq analysis. Uh, of course, the first step would be to do a quality control to check whether the um, assay has uh, indeed worked uh, as expected. The second step would be to determine signal coverage. So uh, going from the reads to a, a signal track that we can display, for example, in a genome browser. A very central point in ChIP-seq analysis is to treat the noise level, so to model the noise level, um, and we're going to address that in, in, in detail. And then, of course, we would like to subtract the noise from the signal um, to get a normalized data set, and this is the next point, point four here. And then the final step in ChIP-seq analysis is to um, determine the enriched regions, significantly enriched regions, which we call peak regions. Then a further step could be um, to perform a differential analysis of ChIP-seq. For example, we're comparing two conditions, but this is a point that I will not address in this lecture here. So this is again um, the, the, the starting point of a ChIP-seq analysis. So we have again here the protein of interest. We see the fragments that have been immunoprecipitated here in blue. And in dark blue are the, um, the, the parts that are actually sequence to high throughput sequencing. And we sequence either on one strand or on the other strand. If we now align these uh, sequence fragments, dark blue and dark red fragments, we obtain something that looks um, uh, like this um, displayed at the bottom left of the, of the slide. So we have a peak, a blue peak, and a red peak, and these two peaks are shifted with respect to each other. On the right-hand side of the slide, you see uh, an actual uh, real, uh, how it looks like in, in real data. And we have indeed here um, uh, a peak of, of red reads and a peak of blue reads that are shifted with respect to each other. And this is a very a typical uh, situation in ChIP-seq, a very typical signal of ChIP-seq experiments, where we have two peaks on the plus and on the minus strand that are shifted with respect to each other. <coughs> 
Now, in, pr in, in, in practice, uh, it is very often um, a little, a slightly different, especially if multiple proteins bind, or in the case of a histone modification, then usually this um, asymmetric pattern that I showed in the previous slide is blurred, and we have more of a um, pattern like at the bottom left, and here's the situation um, how it, it could look like in real data. So we don't recognize very easily this uh, asymmetry and this shift between the plus and the minus strand. But still, this is a very um, typical signal that we're looking at, this uh, two um, peaks on each strand and the shift of the two peaks. Now here's again a, um, um, a locus uh, where I display um, a real data set. We have the reads here in the two bottom tracks, reads on the plus strand, reads on the minus strand. We see that they are slightly shifted with respect to each other. Um, here I have shown an enriched region, a so-called peak region. This is what we're going to uh, find at the very end of the analysis to determine really the boundaries of the regions where we see an enrichment. And here is a signal track where I showed the uh, treatment and this is the background level and we see in this case that the background is very low compared to the, to the signal. Now the first step in any bioinformatic analysis is to do quality control. Um, and there are several ways to do this quality control for ChIP-seq. Um, the first would be to do a qualitative uh, a QC. Uh, meaning that um, it's a good habit to simply have a look at the data. So to load the reads into the uh, uh, genome browser, for example, the IGV browser, and um, look at one particular region here. Uh, so um, this would be a gene promoter, and we see here very nicely that we have a very high um, density of reads at this position, meaning that the uh, immunoprecipitation has worked as expected. Another of these qualitative um, QC uh, could be to simply look at the enrichment of the signal at gene promoters. For example, if we're interested in a particular histone modification, A3K4 trimethylation, which is typically enriched at gene promoters, we would expect that we would see an enrichment at all gene promoters. And this is one of these plots displayed here as a heat map where we have a line, all gene promoters, rank them by the strength of the signal, and we see indeed that we have a lot of gene promoters that show this very strong signal here. Um, and on the right-hand side, I've shown a case where um, the signal is not apparent, so something um, hasn't worked in the experiment. Uh, when we align all the promoters, we don't see uh, this typical enrichment. Now, of course, uh, it's also interesting to have quantitative measures of the quality of the, of the experiment. And one very uh, popular measure of the, um, uh, of the quality is the so-called FRIP, fraction of reads and peaks. So this measures um, how much of the total reads of the experiment fall into these enriched peak regions compared with the overall amount of reads. And the, the higher this fragment, this fraction is, the more uh, we have um, focal enriched regions in the, in the experiment. So the um, fraction of reads and peaks is simply um, computed as the ratio of the reads that fall into these peak regions compared to the total number of reads. Now, the value of this, of course, depends on the experiment. If you look at transcription factors, usually the SFRIP can be very high because we have very focal regions where we have binding of the transcription factor. If we're looking at histone modification where we have a more of a broad signal, usually this FRIP ratio is, is lower. Another very important uh, measure uh, for the quality assessment is the so-called PCR bottleneck coefficient. So due to the PCR amplification in the CHIP-SEC assay, um, it can happen that we end up with a lot of reads that actually PCR duplicates. And so there's a, a, a measure of this effect, which is called a mm, PCR bottleneck coefficient, and which is simply defined as the number of genomic position where just one read aligns and the number of uh, genomic position where one or more read align. So this is displayed here in this formula at the bottom left. The higher this ratio is, the less we have a PCR duplicate um, artifacts. The lower it is, uh, the more we have indeed a problem with the library complexity. So on the right hand side I've shown uh, an extract of an ENCODE um, data set 
where we have two columns with a spot, which is another name for this fraction of reads and peaks, um, which um, has values between 0 0.15 and 0 0.8. Um, and the PCR bottleneck coefficient. And usually a PCR bottleneck coefficient below 0.5 um, indicates a very strong problem, and above 0.8 um, it means it's a, the, um, a very high quality data set. Now, to display the data, to display the signal, uh, we usually want to convert the reads, which are displayed as BAM files, which are stored as BAM files. We want to uh, convert that into a coverage or signal track, which is usually displayed um, or stored in WIG or big WIG format. So here, this is a, a, um, a typical BAM format where we see the individual reads um, here in this column. Um, and this is now converted to a different format, a WIG, big WIG format, where for each genomic loci, we have a value of the signal. So the way this is done is simply um, the reads are aligned on the genome, but remember that the reads only represent the end of the actually uh, immunoprecipitated fragment. And so if we know the length of the fragment, these reads can be uh, aligned, um, can be extended uh, bioinformatically, um, and then we grid the genome into bins of um, 10, 50, or 100 base pairs, and we then simply count how many of these fragments fall into this region. Now, uh, an important aspect here is that um, these counts need to be normalized to the total uh, library size. So if, uh, for example, we have a much higher sequencing because we have sequenced on, on one lane, we will have a total number of reads that is much higher. And this needs to be taken into account. And there are different ways to normalize the uh, bin counts that we just uh, had to the total library size. Okay, so one measure is, for example, RPKM, which is known from uh, RNA-seq experiments, where we normalize uh, the total number of reads to the total number of mapped reads in the library and the size of the bin. And there are different tools that uh, perform this normalization step, like, for example, the BAM coverage tool from the Deep Tools suite. So this is how it looks like. We have here in the bottom the actual reads, which are indicated in red and blue. Um, uh, this would be for a histone modification, which has a very broad signal. We see a broad distribution of reads. And here we see a much more focal distribution of reads corresponding to a particular transcription factor. And we see that it, this is a very sharp signal here. And these signals have been converted to coverage tracks, which are shown here. So this would be the coverage track of the lower part and the coverage track of uh, this part here. Uh, we can see how we can uh, nicely upload and, and, and see the signal in this uh, coverage tracks. OK, signal and noise is a, a very important uh, aspect of chip tech analysis. This is what I um, already mentioned at the very beginning. The fundamental question is whether we have more significantly more signal in the treatment track than in the uh, input or background track. If we look at this, um, this coverage track here, we see a region where we see a very massive enrichment. And so we could think that this, uh, this is the region where we have binding of the protein of interest or where we have a lot of histone modification of interest. Now, if we compare that to the uh, input track, we see that we have exactly the same locus, the same enrichment here. And so this means that the enrichment that we see in the green track is not due to a real uh, binding enrichment, but it's more likely the effect of an artifact. And actually, these two tracks are um, ChIP-SEC experiments from a cell line, MCF7, breast cancer cell line. And this cancer cell line has amplifications, so focal amplification of parts of the genome. And this is exactly one of these regions where we have uh, chromosome amplification. And I've displayed here at the bottom right What's happening, we have actually the same region that is duplicated in the MCF7 genome. And since we map that back to the reference genome, where we don't have this amplification, everything gets mapped to the very same locus. And we see this pileup of reads and this um, high signal. So this shows that it's extremely important to have a reference um, background or input uh, to be able to distinguish between real enrichment and artifacts. This is another example where we have here again a signal track at the, at the top and we see that there's a region where we have no signal at all. 
Now we could imagine that this is a region where there's no binding or no histone modification. But when we look at the input track that is displayed below, we see exactly at the exactly same position um, a lack of signal also. So this again shows that there's something going on at this genomic loci, which is not due to the absence of binding, but which m uh, likely represent an artifact. And uh, below I've displayed the so-called alignability track. Um, and this alignability track tells us um, that um, due to the uh, lower complexity of the, the certain parts of the re uh, genome, for example, if we have repeats, uh, reads can be hardly aligned to this region because they are very ambiguous. So any read that would come from this part of the genome due to its repetitive nature could be aligned multiple times to several positions. So it would lead to very ambiguous alignments. And so usually reads from this part of the genome are discarded because we cannot align them uh, uniquely to the genome. And this is displayed here in these three tracks. Um, the shorter the read is, the more difficult, of course, it is to align. So we see that the situation is slightly better for longer reads, but still we have a large region here where we cannot uh, unambiguously align the reads. And so this region is usually discarded in the alignment, and this is why we have a complete lack of signal here. So again, very important to have a reference where we can see that actually uh, we see exactly the same pattern uh, in the signal and in the, in the input. So Maybe the most important take-home message is that it is absolutely mandatory to have an, a reference um, uh, data set, to have a control sample. And there are several ways to, um, to uh, generate these control samples. For example, um, sometimes a mock IP is performed with an unspecific antibody, um, and the result of this mock IP is then used as a, as a control or um, simply naked DNA is sequenced, um, and this is what we call usually input, and this is the most standard method in uh, current ChIP-seq analysis. Okay, so we, we have a signal track, we have a background track, um, and we would like to subtract the noise from the signal. Um, here are two uh, examples of these two tracks, and we could imagine that simply subtracting the um, noise from the signal could uh, lead to um, um, a noise-free track. But actually this is not possible due to the different sequencing depth. So we need to scale both data sets, one with respect to the other, to be able to perform this subtraction. And I've already addressed a two, uh, possibility to do the scaling. For example, these RPKM is a way to take into account the total library size to do the proper scaling of the two data sets. So this is a, um, a toy example. Uh, suppose we have an input with 12 million reads here, and we have a treatment where we only have 10 million reads because it has been sequenced a little bit less uh, deep. And in that case, we would have a, um, a scaling factor of 1.2, and we would scale the smaller of the two data sets up by 1.2, and would, would lead to this dashed line here. And uh, having done this operation, we could then uh, carry on with the subtraction of the two tracks. Now in the next slide I will show why this is not a, this naive approach is not a good, um, uh, a good way to handle this normalization. Um, and this is, a, this is a, again a very simple toy example. So let's suppose that we have an input here, a continuous input, and we have an area which would be something like 10 here, right? So this is simply the area under this red line here. Now we have a signal track, where we have a, um, a noise line here, and we have two regions where we have signal. And the total area under this green curve would be 10 plus 4 plus 4 would be 18. In that case, we would have a scaling factor of 1.8, and we would scale the smaller of the two, the input, up by 1.8, leading to this estimation of the background signal. And we see that in this case, the background signal is overestimated with respect to the real background signal in this green track. And this is because these two regions that contain a lot of signal lead to this overestimation of the total noise signal. So the noise level is overestimated due to these two regions that contain actually a very strong signal. So the solution is simply to uh, 
hide these um, regions um, before we do the scaling, before we perform the scaling. We simply hide the regions which apparently contain a lot of signal and then compute the scaling factor. And by doing so, we obtain a much more um, realistic estimation of the background level. And this very simple idea has been implemented in one particular tool, which is called PeakSeq. And we see here um, a scatter plot um, of the signal in the input and in the chipset sample. So every dot here is a window of one megabase. And what we see is the signal in this window in the input and the signal in the actual treatment. And we see that it nicely follows a uh, diagonal line, except for, for some windows which have a much stronger uh, signal in the treatment than in the input, which means that actually some regions have uh, a real signal compared to the input. And these um, regions here uh, pull this regression line towards a much higher slope. And so we would overestimate the ratio um, of noise between the two data sets due to, this, um, to these uh, windows which show this very high enrichment. If we remove these windows, we have the plot that is at the right-hand side, and we see that here the correlation or the slope is now 0 0.96 compared to the 1.25 uh, which we had on the, on the left-hand side, meaning that the scaling factor is actually much lower than what had been estimated with this very naive approach. An alternative approach is um, what we call fingerprints. Fingerprints are a very um, easy and very intuitive way to see enrichment in the signal. So the formula on the left-hand side look a little bit scary, but it's actually very simple. We bin the genome into windows and we compute the number of reads in each one of these windows. And then we order all the windows in order of increasing number of reads. And then we look at the cumulative signal over the top um, 10, 20, 30 percent of the, of the regions, starting from the ones which have the lowest uh, signal. And this is displayed here on the right-hand side in the plot, where we have the cumulative amount of signal in the 10, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 percent of the windows, starting from the ones which have the lowest uh, amount of signal. So if all the windows would have an equal amount of signal, we would have a, we would have a diagonal line here uh, in, this, um, in this cumulative curve. And what we see here, for example, that the input on purple is this curve here. So it's not a diagonal line, but it, it grows um, rather slowly. And we can compare that to a, a ChIP-seq for histone modification, which are the, here these lines which have a more, much more bent uh, behavior. So meaning that um, up to 80% or 90% of the windows, we have a low amount of signal, and the top 10% of windows, which have the highest signal, actually um, um, represent most of the total signal in this data set. So these 10% of the windows, which are indicated here in red, actually contain 75% of the reads, meaning that the enrichment are very focal, are restricted to certain windows in the, in the genome. And this is very different from the input behavior here. So this fingerprint plot is a very convenient way to tell whether we really have enrichment as expected in the chipsec. And sometimes we see experiments where the treatment actually follows exactly the same uh, curve as the input meaning that we have a very, um, very uh, low enrichment in the, in the data set. So we can really tell whether uh, our uh, immunoprecipitation has worked or whether uh, it has failed for some region. Again, the shape of these curves depend on the type of um, uh, chipsec data set that is uh, analyzed. Sharp peaks, transcription factors have this very, um, very um, bent behavior broad histone modification, K27 trimethylation, have a, 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 a slower a increase in this uh, curve. Using these fingerprints, we can actually estimate the scaling factor between the input and the signal. So what is usually done is that we select the point where we have the strongest difference between the input and the treatment data set, and we look at the ratio of these two points here to estimate the scaling factor that is applied then to the two data sets to make them comparable in terms of overall signal.
Okay, so now we have um, described how we can scale, compare the input and the treatment, how we can uh, subtract the noise level from the, from the treatment. And now comes the, the core part of ChIP-SEC analysis is to determine the genomic regions which actually show this very specific enrichment. Now before we can do that, there's a number uh, of steps that we need to perform. Remember again that what is sequenced is not the full fragment, but is only the end part of the fragments. And there are two different um, strategies now to, to handle this. One is called tag shifting and the other one is called tag enrichment. So keep in mind that the actual position of the binding, when we look at the binding of a transcription factor, for example, the actual binding site generally has not been sequenced because the end fragments uh, do not correspond to the binding here. So tag shifting simply means that if we know the overall fragment length, we can simply shift these little reads by half of the fragment length to the uh, three prime ends and obtain a pileup at the position of the binding site. Strand is, uh, tag extension actually means that we will um, extend uh, these little reads to the full size of the fragment. So this is how tag re uh, read shifting or tag shifting looks like. We take all these plus and minus strand reads and we simply shift them by the, uh, by the half of the fragment size. And where we, uh, we would uh, go from a, a pileup, a blue pileup and a red pileup to a pileup of the shifted reads at the position of the binding site indicated here by this dot. The second strategy is read extension, where we actually take these reads and extend them by the full length of the, uh, the fragment. And then we would go from a blue and red pileup to this purple pileup uh, from the uh, extended reads. So these are two different strategies that can be applied before we do uh, actually peak calling. So peak calling, um, it's, it's a matter, like I said at the very beginning, to determine where we have significantly more enrichment uh, compared to the expected signal. Um, and what is very often um, used is a sliding window over the genome and at each position of the window, we determine whether we have this significant enrichment. So there are many, many uh, peak calling algorithms uh, which have implemented different strategies. And I will describe one very popular uh, peak calling, which is based on the sliding window approach. So at each position of the sliding window, which is indicated here by these uh, green frames, um, we can compare the signal we see in the treatment to the signal we see in the input and estimate, for example, through a Poisson distribution, whether this is significantly higher than what we see here. So for the left window, we would have indeed a significant enrichment in the treatment compared to the input. And for the right uh, window, we would have no significant enrichment uh, in the treatment versus the input. So one of these peak calling algorithm is called MAX2, uh, or MAX, and it has been published in 2008, um, and is a very popular uh, peak calling algorithm. And I will describe now in the next uh, slides the different steps in the peak calling algorithm. So the first is, no matter whether we do read extension or read uh, shifting, we need to estimate the fragment size. So either we know the fragment size from the experiment, or we can estimate that, again, from this very typical chip sec uh, pattern that we described at the beginning, the shift between the plus and the minus strand. Um, and from this shift, from the shift between the peaks of these two uh, pileups, we can estimate the fragment size. And this is displayed here on the right-hand side, where we have the profile of the enrichment of the reads on the plus strand and on the minus strand, and we estimate the fragment size by the shift in the peak of these two distributions. And this is something that is done automatically uh, in MAX at the first step. So the regions which show apparent enrichment are extracted, and then from these extracted regions, we can de determine these profile plots and estimate the fragment size from the distance between the peaks of these two uh, curves. Now, having these estimated fragment distance, we can do um, read shifting and obtain these uh, coverage plots, which we see here for the input and for the, um, and for the treatment. <coughs> 
So now we need to estimate um, the enrichment, and this is done based on the Poisson distribution. The Poisson distribution has a nice property that it only depends on one particular parameter, which is called lambda. Um, and lambda is the expected background uh, level. And this lambda is estimated on windows of different sizes. So around a particular um, region of interest, we can estimate the background level here in this track over a small window of 1 KB, 5 KB, 10 KB, or over all the genome. And what MAX does, it takes the highest of these lambda estimated over these different sizes, um, and the highest lambda would correspond to the most conservative estimation of the background level. And so now we have the parameter, the local parameter of this Poisson distribution, and this is done again at each position of the sliding window. And once we have this lambda for a particular position, we can estimate the p-value from the Poisson distribution with this particular lambda, and we can estimate how significant this signal is compared to the estimated background signal. And here in that case, we would have an extremely significant enrichment of 10 to the minus 20. We have a p-value at each position, at each window, uh, each sliding window. And of course, this is a very high multiple testing uh, problem because we have so many windows when we slide over the whole genome. So we need to correct for this multiple testing. And this is implemented in Max using an empirical FDR, uh, false discovery rate estimation. Um, and the idea is very simple, that we simply swap treatment and input and we redo the whole procedure um, considering the real input as being the treatment and the real treatment as being the input. And so we're going to call what we call negative peaks um, using this swapped uh, procedure. And these negative peaks are indicated here in red, and the positive ones, which we uh, determine uh, using the standard way, are the green ones. And so we have a bag of positive and negative uh, peaks, each one with a p-value, and we could order them by um, increasing p-value. So these would be the peaks which have the slowest p-value, um, the, the lowest p-value, which are the most significant, and these would be the peaks which have the highest p-value, which are less significant. And then we can order them and look where are the negative peaks. And at each rank here in this ordering, we can determine how many peaks we have overall, with a p-value smaller than one particular level. So this would be this set here. And out of these, how many false peaks we have, which are these red peaks here, obtained through this uh, swapping procedure. And the FDR is simply the number of negative peaks we have to up to a certain level of p-value compared to the total number of peaks. And so here in this case, we would have two negative peaks out of these 25 peaks corresponding to an FDR of 0.08 uh, or 8%. And this is the way that uh, Max estimates this empirical false discovery rate. Okay, so to summarize what we've uh, discussed, um, we have discussed quality control, um, which is the basic, um, the, the first step in uh, any kind of analysis of sequencing uh, data sets. We have this qualitative quality control, just looking at certain regions of interest, or we have these quantitative uh, measures, PCR bottleneck coefficient or fraction of reads and peaks. We have seen how we turn reads or BAM files into coverage or big WIC files and how we can um, scale the input and the treatment tracks to make them comparable. And then we have discussed finally how we can determine uh, enriched peak regions um, and describe in, in detail how this MAX algorithm works. Now the last point, which I, I will, not, um, will not detail here in this lecture, is doing uh, differential analysis when we want to compare two conditions, treatment, no treatment, disease uh, healthy, and we want to see whether we have regions that show a significant differential enrichment in ChIP-seq.